Hey everybody, welcome to my cave. I'm Adam Savage, you are on Tested.com, and today's one day build is a really cool device that I learned about while we were filming the Mythbusters NASA episode, and it's called a retro reflector. Um, a retro reflector, well, rather than just tell you about one, I can show you one. This is a retro reflecting prism. And its features that make it a retro reflector are that it has three polished surfaces that are all at exactly 90 degrees to each other. So in one sense, you could say that the back of this retro reflector represents the corner of a cube, right? 90, 90, and 90. Why is that important? Well, uh, when you fire, uh, okay, let's say you're firing a pellet gun at a 90 degree angle, that pellet is going to come back at parallel to your original shot. That's a feature of a 90 degree angle. No matter what angle it's at, it's going to, the math is gonna add up that the pellet comes back parallel. That also means that when you shine a light into the corner of two mirrors, it comes right back to the source. You might have noticed this in hotel bathrooms, which is where they often have mirrors that meet in corners, that you can always see your face in the corner. If you've noticed that, you've noticed what is the rudiment and the main operating principle of a retro reflector. The fact is, is that you were looking at two 90 degree surfaces. If you added a third, your eyes would always be seeing your face, your eyes right in that corner. And it's really neat. Um, we use retro reflectors every single day. A bicycle reflector is essentially, if you take one and look at it close up, you'll notice it is made up of lots of little corners like this lined up in a row. And NASA has built a, several different retro reflectors that they have left on the moon for the purposes of scientific investigation. <clears throat> in fact, on one of the moon landing, on the moon landing episode that we shot for Mythbusters, we went down to, uh, uh, to an observatory whose job was to fire a laser at the moon every single night at the retro reflector that was on the moon. Now, <clears throat> the amount of spread you get, even from a highly columnar laser from Earth, by the time it's traveled the half a million miles to the moon and back, total, right? It's 250 miles, 250,000 miles each way, about half a million miles to come back. Um, by the time it gets to the moon, the spread is gargantuan, no matter how columnar you try and make it. And by the time it comes back, you're literally firing like quadrillions of photons at the moon and you're getting 30 or 40 back. But those 30 or 40 tell a tale. They tell you exactly how far away the moon is. They tell you, uh, they allow them to actually uh, quantize and make even more precise uh, uh, confirmations of theory of relativity. And when we discovered that a retroflector was something they'd left on the moon, I wanted to build one. I built one for Mythbusters. I built uh, a, a flat array retroreflector. But there's another kind I found recently that uses retroreflecting prisms. And NASA has used several of these as well. And I want to make, uh, well, here's a picture of Na one of NASA's retroreflectors. This is what I want to make today. And I have assembled the parts to do it. It's a fairly simple and straightforward build. Of course, I'm going to make it slightly more complex, but I'm going to begin by gathering my parts. Shall we start? First up is the dome. That is going to be my dome. Second up are the prisms. I bought these on Amazon. Uh, third up are some drills for making holes. I have a template. I'm going to piece of paper for making a template. I think first up, this is going to be the collar and this will sit on top of that collar. I kind of think I want to, uh, I gotta mark this up and then I gotta cut it to match that. Yeah. And then I've got to uh, drill the holes. I shouldn't mount them together until I've done that, but that's the first part is, mm, mm, this is tricky. No, I think I do want to, right now, this is a somewhat flimsy piece of metal and I'm nervous about drilling these big holes through it. 
Um, first up is I got to do a bunch of layout. That's the first trick is I got to make some lines on this and make some cut lines and figure out exactly how big this retro reflector actually is. And I did some tests on another half of this. Oh yeah, this is actually a circular cake mold. So I bought two halves of an aluminum sphere of a six inch aluminum sphere. Um, fairly cheap. It's totally awesome. I did some testing on another one. So I'm going to use that to kind of get my bearings here. A good drafting compass is so important. I'm going to make a series of some small lines in case I was not quite perfect about my measuring. And this is just to make sure I've centered my, uh, my ball. Let's see here. Yeah, it's not quite perfectly round, but it is round enough. Okay. So now I want to make a X, Y, and I want to find the top dead center of this bad boy. You know, I wish I had a large angle, angle plate, which I don't have in my collection. And I, I purchased one recently. It's on its way, but it hasn't arrived yet. Um, that would allow me to mount this this way and do a, oh, actually, oh, ah, I got it, uh, right. I need, I need an aluminum plate, check, awesome, I need a large flat thing that sits parallel to that aluminum plate, and that would be my stone, this is a, a machinist stone for doing layout work, uh, that's, that's not great. Uh, I gotta get some shims. There we go. Here's how we're gonna do this. Here's how we're gonna find the top dead center of this thing. Push it down here. All right. And that is, yep, that's the distance. Great. So, uh, that distance is precisely, that distance is precisely six, Point three inches. Great. So 3.15 inches is the exact height that I'm looking for. Because I will set this height gauge at 3.15 inches. That's 3.15, right? Great. I'm going to lock the top and I'll adjust the bottom. A height gauge is a great thing to have in your collection and you're about to see why. What you heard me doing was taking a piece of plywood and drilling a hole in its center. I will now use this piece of plywood to hold on to this guy and leave the center. Uh, so I should be able to clamp this with these two clamps. This is, this is one of the things that makes it hard to work alone. A third pair of hands would be really helpful about now. I don't have a third pair of hands, so I'm just going to have to make do. So you stay there. And you go here. Ladies and gentlemen, there we go. Okay, so as long as this is touching the bottom, I know... That's it, that's it, great, yes. So here we go, bring in the height gauge. And I'm just gonna, because I just moved it, I'm gonna check its me uh, measurement one more time. And I like it, it is accurate. So here it comes. And I am just going to scribe. So the edge of a height gauge is very sharpened piece of steel and I'm going to scribe part of my X in there. Now, I'm gonna loosen this just a little bit. And I'm gonna turn this roughly 90. Doesn't have to be exactly 90. And we're at roughly 90. I bring in the edge of the height gauge and I simply scribe across 
Now, that should be center. And if I want to make sure that it's center, I simply turn this again. And if I turn it again, I should it should still cross center when I scribe it. Let's just make sure. Double check. And that is crossing within 20 thou of the center. That is good enough for me. So having properly scribed it, I can put all this stuff away and I can start to mark up. Can I? Yes, I can. I can start to mark up my, uh, my dome here. So now I'll put it back on my template. I'm going to make four cardinal marks. I'll clean these off later, but for right now. One, two. And I know these are perpendicular to each other because I measured them carefully. And now all I need to do is carry that mark up and over here to its brethren. And it would be great if I had a great way of mounting this, then I could use the height gauge to do that, uh, but I don't. So um, what I am gonna need to do is get a piece of flexible plastic and hold it on there. It's hard to know that you're drawing a perfectly straight line on a curve from two points because you could drift off in the middle of those two points. However, because I have three points, top, bottom, and center, I actually have the ability, I actually have the ability to cross all three points and make sure that I am drawing, yeah. Yep, and great, that's good, that's good. So we'll just draw, stop, and then we'll do another one, that to that, all the way to, all the way to that. Is that gonna work? Ah, great. Cool. So I'm gonna start with a three quarter inch uh, circle in the center, and that's gonna provide me my correct distances. These circle templates have cardinal markings on them, one and these little markings here, one, two, three, four. So I line those up with these and then I know that I'm drawing that circle on center. Um, I could also use the compass to do that and I actually will for some of the placement of the others. Um, oh, the prisms. The prisms that I'm using are one inch retro reflective prisms and you can buy them in a batch of 10. Um, there they are and I need uh, I need them placed around in the arrangement exactly like the NASA one, uh, and I only need eight of them. So I've got two sacrificial ones. So here we go. And I need those other marks because I need to hit this on center. Great. Another one. There are even more careful ways to do this kind of layout, but since this is a, a sort of a sort of a prop, I am uh, I'm going a little fast and loose. So now it's incumbent on me to add another circle right here, and I want that circle to be I want that circle and these two circles to draw an equilateral triangle. And what that means is I need to know the center of this triangle and the center of this triangle. And that is actually a knowable thing. All right, so if I have an equilateral triangle and I know that that's one of its sides, I draw an arc of that length from the middle of one circle and actually I'll do it across both sides because when I draw it from the center of its adjacent circle, 
the points at which they cross describe the center of the third circle. Okay, so now I am simply going to set my compass to draw a one inch circle. The third circle, look at that. There you have it. Okay. So there you have all eight of the circles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now I need to cut this off kind of about there. Um, the question is how to do that. Okay. I figured out how to uh, match the outer cut of this so that it is the same external radius as this pipe here. And what I've done is I've managed to put the dome down on the pipe so it's totally flat. So when I spin it, uh, it shows the same level with my height. Ah, there we go. So when I spin it, it shows the same level with my height gauge. Then I only need to know the distance, right? So basically I put this totally level on top of the pipe and put it in a little pressure and checked it with the height gauge and it's within a few thou all the way around. So now all I need to know is the difference between, is the distance actually here, right there. What is that distance? And that distance is 1.65. So now I use this to set the height gauge to 1.65 inches. Good. That is 1.65 inches, and then here's what we do. We simply do this. Oh, this is a cool NASA prop we're making today, everybody. This line represents my cut line around this. Now how to cut it. This is super thin material. This is 030. Uh, it's not going to like me cutting it. I mean, I could almost cut it with some air nibbler. An air nibbler, that's exactly how to do it. But first, I need to drill the holes. That's the most important part. So you don't use a normal drill bit to drill holes in super thin sheet material like this. Uh, to do so would be folly, and I'll explain why. I need a one inch hole in this 30 thousandths thick material. This is a one inch drill bit. So how does the drill bit work? Well, the drill bit's front end, I know I've beaten the crap out of this drill bit, I apologize. The front end of this drill bit is a pair of chisels. They're at about a 30 degree angle and they're traveling around and there it is, that little draft angle. This chisel is peeling up material. So it's two chisels opposing each other, turn, tearing through material. And then the spiral flutes carry that material up. If you attempted to use this drill bit on this stuff, it would dent it. The moment it broke through, it would pull it in. It would just be a horror show. That's why we use a thing called a unibit. Uh, and that is these. These are some of the most important things you could have in your shop. Um, Instead of pulling the drill bit into the material, what this is is a side chisel that scrapes the material out with a very low draft angle at each level. So each one of these little steps is a different size hole you can drill. And since I need a one inch hole, and that's on this big bad boy, um, I'm actually going to creep up on that hole. I am not going to try and drill it all at once because that way lies madness. As a maker, you learn early that you've got to incrementalize that stuff. I'm also gonna use my smallest cordless drill so I have some sensitivity to the material. And I'm gonna start by drilling eight half inch holes in this piece here. That right there is an engineering miracle to me that that works. Have your 
are eight holes for the primary prism shape. Now it's time to move on to the bigger bit. There is a really cool feature to these bits in that you see how this hole is not perfectly centered in the line? That is slightly problematic. However, I have discovered with the Unibit, if I push slightly in that direction as it's cutting, I can bring it into concentricity. And each step provides me a little bit of an extra opportunity. Now, if you take a look, you'll see it's far more centered in the hole. And that's because I can actually move, oh, I can move this bit while I am using it. That is totally amazing to me. Those are eight, seven eighths inch holes. We're going along gangbusters. Now it's time to take each hole to its next, to its next diameter, which is one inch. And for this, I want to be very, very careful. halfway there we have four of the four of the pieces cut and uh, four of the holes cut and we're gonna continue on the more the more I cut into this the more delicate it gets and the more dangerous my cuts get and so I have to be very 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 careful on that front So oh, just to be clear, I'm like applying a clamping force on this, but mostly below the line of the holes because I don't want to crush it here. I'm also trying to hold this really rigid and allow it to do its scraping. And if I go a little fast, see that worked, but I'm too scared of doing that for every cut because uh, you know, if it grabs and grabs really fast, then I'm really boned. So now, I have my holes cut. Uh, I am going to do a little bit of a uh, little bit of cleaning up. All right, that's pretty well cleaned up. Now the question is, does my prism fit in each one? Let's just try. Yes. 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 Yes, 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 and yes, great. Prism successful. Okay, so now I want to cut it on this line. This is what I think I'm going to use to cut through, to cut this line around here to meet up with this guy. And uh, it's called an air nibbler. We're going to do a test of it on the other half of this globe. The nibbler has this little tiny this little tiny notch up here that you can't see because it's moving too fast for the camera. This little piston moves up and down. So it's basically, you feed something in there like this and watch this. It nibbles like that. Now I'm gonna have to practice with that without looking at the camera so I can see if I can get this right. All right. All right, left side of the cut is the accurate side. <laughs> Whew. All right, that is a rough cutout. This part weighs grams at this point. It is really, really flimsy. The next step is to clean this edge up on the sander.
I have my part cut out. It's not beautiful. It's going to need a little more beautifying. And I think I've cut it slightly oversized for the piece. But now I need to lathe off the, uh, uh, the little half inch thick section of the pipe so that I can come down here and be that part. Well, um, I'm a little bit of a jerk and I cut this piece without filming and I totally forgot. I forgot that I was filming. I'm so sorry. Uh, but I cut a ring off that four and a half inch pipe. I actually beveled the edge here to get a nice marrying surface. I matched the angle and you can see we're very close to uh, our retro reflector right now. I just need to trim off a bit more. The question is, yeah, I'm gonna trim off some more. Um, I gotta get a fair bit out of here, actually. Okay, with a little more work on the uh, scotch Bright wheel, I've gotten it very close. Here's what I'm gonna do, though. That's very close, but I wanna, what a nice edge on that. So, I'm gonna glue it with some epoxy. I'm gonna let it set, and then I am going to do the last bit of the polish before putting in the lenses. That should take me about 40 minutes. Uh, really important when you're gluing with epoxy, not to just glue smooth surface to smooth surface. You wanna add some tooth to your build. I can't believe I mixed two minute epoxy and now you're watching me rush through this step, but hey, we are all flawed vessels. Why shouldn't I show you? <laughs> These aren't how-to videos. These are more like what the hell happened videos. Great, we're still a little soft. That's awesome. Okay. There's probably some chemical engineers out there who know exactly what brand or what type of thermoset I'm using because I've reported that it smells like skunk. Or maybe they've put a skunk smell in it so that you're sensitive to the files and what they're gonna do to you. All right, so I'm gonna pot this in there. Great, that's awesome. Fabulous, we're centered. Now I'm gonna get a piece of wood on there. And I'm gonna put some weight. Very pleased. Excelsior. Now we wait. Uh, let's see, we have uh, a few minutes. Oh, for, oh, oh, I pulled off too much weight on one side and I thought I had unset the whole thing, but luckily I have not. It seems to be fairly stable. All right, I am gonna take this to the sander and start to clean it up. Cleaned up the edge on my belt sander. You can see, got a nice finish there. I started with a coarse grit belt and went to a fine grit belt and I did some scotch bright on this. It's time to attach the mirrors. I know, I know there are four holes here, 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 and here, but um, I am not comfortable installing those just yet. That's gonna be a later addition to this. So to finish this, we're just putting in the mirrors. In order to put in the prisms, I don't wanna get my fingerprints on them. So I am going to put on some rubber gloves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. I'm gonna use O-rings for my frame around the, yeah. I'm making them flush to the top, and then I'm gonna pop them right in there. And I am going to use a spot of the hot glue. Ay, 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 goodness gracious. I'm gonna use a spot of the hot glue in order, ooh, ooh. oh, you weren't on. The thing about a retro reflector that makes it so useful uh, is that it always reflects back to its point source, which means it's fantastic for range finding between two objects. 
And I haven't read too deeply into the use of retro reflectors in space with NASA, but I would wager that when you're trying to dock two different vehicles in space and thus Delta V, their relative speeds are, and distance are really, really vital, the retro reflectors may play a key role in them understanding exactly where they are in relation to each other. Um, for me, it's just gonna be a cool thing. Oh, it's really nice to be able to handle something without getting it greasy. Oh, it's starting to look pretty. Yeah, see that? Look at that. That's starting to look like a professional thing. Mm-hmm. That might be. This is so cool. Hey. So, let's start. Okay, the four outside ones are glued in. Oh, I don't want any tendrils. No tendrils on my glass. Damn it. Get off there. If I have any tendrils, they will show from the front and I can't deal. I don't want that. I want them to be in this wall. There you have it. This is my beautiful model replica of a NASA retro reflector. Shine a light at it, you will see it reflect right back to that light. We will include some links to all of these pieces and parts and bits and bobs so you can order them yourself and maybe make one of these for your own collection. Thank you guys for joining me. This has been a really fun, super fast one day build. Thanks for joining me. I will see you next time. Thanks for watching 100% of whatever you just watched. That's awesome, we get to add that to our completion rate. You deserve something. You deserve a t-shirt for all your hard work. Follow the link below and buy yourself a tested official t-shirt.